This is The Creative Funding Show, a podcast for authors, YouTubers, and podcasters who want to fund the work they love without selling out. Episode 1. In terms of creative funding, I see creators making money in seven primary ways. This is Thomas Umstatt, and in this episode, we're going to take a broad overview of how creators can make money. In the future, we'll take deep dives into each one of these ways. We'll be talking with guests on specifically what they're doing, but I want to kind of give a broad overview. And if you are creating, if you're making YouTube videos, if you have a podcast, and right now you are making zero money uh, or very, very little money, I want to kind of give you an idea of the sorts of options you have. You might be surprised how many different ways creators make money. So the first way is merch and tangible goods like hats and shirts. Uh, Merch allows members of your tribe to identify each other in real life. I remember Homestar Runner doing this in the early 2000s. I don't know if any of you remember Homestar Runner, but it was a pre-YouTube creation of two guys, the Brothers Chaps, and they funded their... uh, Flash videos. These were made in Flash back when that was themed. Little animations with Homestar Runner and Strong Bad and the Cheat. And uh, the primary way they funded themselves, maybe the exclusive way they funded themselves, was selling hats and shirts. And I will say, I probably spent $50, $100 on Homestar Runner merch because I wanted to be able to identify the other people around me who were uh, Homestar Runner fans. So they'd see me wearing a shirt that had uh, a reference to something in the Homestar Runner universe, and we would be able to connect over that. It allowed us nerds to find each other in the real world. Uh, This works best typically for YouTubers and bloggers, people who communicate visually. Uh, So Philip DeFranco, very famous YouTuber, has a shirt, uh, Why Be Informed When You Can Use Your Feelings As Your Facts uh, shirt, which is a great example uh, of this sort of thing because it allows his audience to find each other, but it also connects with like the core essence of his show. He has a fact-based news show. He tries to give both sides. I feel like he does a good job of that. Uh, He lets both sides speak for themselves and has long quotes and links where you can do more research. So it's a kind of a reasonable show in this Uh, shirt captures that essence while also being a way for his fans to find each other uh, at a crowded bar or something like that. Um, Now, this can work for podcasters. Uh, The History of Rome podcast has the Livia Did It shirt, uh, which we'll talk about in a future episode, kind of how they're uh, raising money for that podcast. It's very creative, um, which is the essence of this show. I love to see people funding their creativity in creative ways. Uh, the the one thing you have to be careful, though, with merchandise is that you kind of have two options. One is print on demand, which is low risk. Uh, you work with a website like Cafe Press. They print one shirt for every time you get one order. Uh, the nice thing about that is that you don't lose any money uh, if it's not popular and you're not stuck with boxes and boxes of unsold shirts of the wrong size in your garage. The downside, though, is that your margins are really low. When every shirt is made individually, the cost to you, the creator, for each one of those shirts is really high. And so you're not actually making very much per shirt. It's much more profitable if you get your shirts printed in bulk, where you get a thousand shirts printed. You know, if you print a thousand shirts, you can get them made for, you know, three or four dollars a shirt, maybe even less, depending on the quality and where you're going with that printing. So if you're spending, let's say, $5 to make the math easy, because I always scare doing math live on the air. Uh, let's say you spend $5 on the shirt, and you're selling the shirt for $20. Well, you're making $15 a shirt, whereas with print-on-demand, you may be paying $15 for a shirt and selling it for the same 20 now you're only making $5 a shirt. So it makes a big difference whether you print on demand or whether you get them uh, printed up in bulk. Uh, The other advantage of a print on demand service like Cafe Press is that Uh, You can put your logo or your slogan on lots of items. So mouse pads and hats and mugs and you name it, uh, they offer that. And so you can make money that way. It's not going to be great money, uh, but we'll talk about uh, and talk with people who have done this and made this work. Shirts in general are kind of risky to print in mass because you have to know how many men's larges to get as opposed to men's extra larges as opposed to women's smalls. And, you you know, it's really easy to print the wrong number of shirts. And, you know, you sell out of your men's XLs right away and you have a million smalls that you can't get rid of or vice versa. And that can be a bit of a challenge to predict that. But there are ways. There are ways of predicting that. And one way is to just pre-sell. 
you sell all your shirts ahead of time and then you close sales and then you place your order is, is one way to do that. Um, so that's merch. That's the first way. The second way that creators make money is by selling products. Now, um, product is something that people buy for itself. Uh, merch is like they're putting the logo on a shirt. A product can be an intangible good like courses or software. Uh, the most classic product is authors. Their product is their book. And for musicians, their product is their music. <laughs> so they're selling the CD or they're selling MP3 downloads. Uh, this is how I funded the Novel Marketing Podcast. We or a podcast of marketing for authors. And what did we sell? We sold plugins, WordPress plugins, like My Book Table, which allowed you to put a bookstore on your WordPress website, or My Book Progress, which allowed you to put a very, very sophisticated, fancy um, progress bar on your WordPress website. And then later we launched a course uh, that helped people grow uh, their platform and become best-selling authors and started from never written a book before as a five-year plan. So for people wanting overnight success, we had a five-year plan of how to prepare for that overnight success. Basically, there's no shortcuts. Was, the plan is all the hard work that you have to do to be successful. That course has sold very well to our listeners, and our listeners really love it. We've gotten great feedback from the course. And so we funded the uh, podcast with sales of the course primarily. Uh, we're more recently getting into Patreon. And actually, with, with our Patreon uh, campaign, we have discounts on the course as one of the benefits of being a Patreon backer. So you back us for $2, you save 50% on the course, and that has cross-sold copies of the course. So we've been able to use our Patreon money to help sell products. Uh, but uh, this is a better fit. Products are a better fit for authors and for uh, musicians. So while merch is better for like YouTubers and, bl and bloggers, products fits better uh, with people who the creation they're doing is creating a product. A YouTuber is not going to sell a DVD of their videos. So, I mean, maybe somebody's doing that, but I just don't see that as being a very reproducible strategy for most YouTubers. All right, let's talk about the third way that creators make money, and that is affiliate revenue. This is where you recommend a product, and if your fans click your link to buy the product, you get a commission. Uh, the key here is to be very transparent about your affiliate links. Uh, and this is important for two reasons. One, it's the honest thing to do. And having uh, authenticity and integrity with your fans is really important. They'll turn on you if they feel that you're being dishonest. Uh, but secondly, if that first argument wasn't compelling to you, if your fans love you, they're going to want to click your affiliate links. So I'm a big fan of Dan Carlin. He's a podcaster. He had a political podcast I was a big fan of. He has a history podcast, Hardcore History, that I just love. And every time before I make a big Amazon purchase, I go to his website and specifically do the first search through the search bar on his website so that he gets the affiliate commission for my Amazon purchase just because I want to support his show because I'm a big fan of what he's doing and I want him to get a little kickback. Your fans, if they love you, will be the exact same way. If you put that affiliate link in brackets, maybe they're not ready to buy that digital camera you're recommending right away. But when they do decide to make that purchase, they'll go dig up your YouTube video and click the affiliate link just so you get some of the money. And so uh, if you're doing a good job connecting emotionally with your fans, disclosing your affiliate connection is actually going to help you, not hurt you. Uh, yes, to be compliant, you can bury it in the legalese of your privacy policy, but I, I recommend putting affiliate link in parentheses right next to the link. And I try to do that uh, every time I have an affiliate link. I, I'm not able to do it, or I don't always remember, but I'm, I'm doing better. Every The more I go, the better a job I'm doing of disclosing in a very, very obvious way uh, the affiliate links. Now, when it comes to affiliate programs, uh, Amazon has by far the most popular affiliate program, uh, partly because it's the easiest to sign up for. Uh, you can sign up for it very, very quickly, and partly because everyone shops on Amazon and Amazon sells everything. So the benefit of Amazon's affiliate program is that you sign up for one affiliate program and you can sell everything from a computer to a digital camera to you know, some products for doing your yard, right? You can buy worms on Amazon for your compost pile and everything in between. It's a, a very popular platform and their affiliate program pays between four and 8% and it's on a graduating scale. So your first products that you sell in a month, you'll get a 4% commission. And if you're really popular, you'll get as much as 8%. 
Uh, Amazon's not available in all states. Uh, their affiliate program's not available in all states, and that's because uh, they're in fights with state legislatures over sales tax. Uh, this is less of a problem than it used to be. Amazon seems to be signing peace treaties with states. Um, th- you can always set up a corporation in a different state to get around this, but that's uh, not worth it unless you're making a lot of sales, uh, potentially. Uh, making Amazon's affiliate program easier is actually one of the reasons why we made my book table uh, for authors. They can create a bookstore and it creates all of the affiliate links. And I should point out here, Amazon isn't the only company with an affiliate program. Barnes & Noble has an affiliate program. Uh, most companies actually have an affiliate program. If you just scroll to the bottom, you'll see an affiliates uh, button at the bottom of their website and you can sign up to sell affiliate products through that uh, company. So if you're a big fan of a certain company, uh, you can sign up for their affiliate program often without having to ask their permission. This is what's nice about affiliate revenue is that it's a totally automated service. Typically, all I have to do is you put your employee identification number, your social security number, so they can report the taxes, and that's all there is to it. Sometimes there's some application uh, where you say how you're going to be bringing in money, and there's often some rules. Every affiliate program has their rules of what you can and cannot do, and like here's what you have to do with our trademark, blah, blah, blah. But in general, it's very straightforward, and especially for YouTubers, you know, you do a review of a digital camera, and you put a link to that digital camera on Amazon that can be a really great source of revenue for you, and it's as a value to your Viewers, you're actually making their life better by linking directly to the product on Amazon. (laughs) Uh, So they don't have to search. Maybe they're getting the wrong thing if they're wanting to check out that product. Uh, One other thing on uh, affiliates, Uh, Amazon's program and many others work the same way. Let's say you recommended a digital camera and they click your affiliate link. How that works is it puts a cookie on that person's computer uh, or their phone and any purchase they make in the next three days you get credit for. So let's say you recommend a Canon digital camera and they go on to buy a Nikon digital camera, but they got to Amazon from your link, you still get credit for the Nikon. So dropping that cookie on people's uh, computers, uh, you get credit for a lot of things, including products you didn't recommend at all. So if they put the digital camera in their shopping cart and they also put some worms for their compost in the backyard, you get an affiliate commission on both of those purchases. And I will say affiliate revenue is best in November and December uh, because sometimes you can get credit for someone's entire Christmas shopping. So they go on a big shopping spree on Amazon, you get credit for that. I've noticed this being less that way as more people have Prime. Prime members tend to not pile things up in their shopping carts. They tend to just make purchases all day long. Um, Non-Prime Amazon members, though, are amazing because they have to put a certain number of uh, items in their cart to get free shipping. And so they're like incentivized to have a big cart worth of stuff and you can get 4% off of that entire cart. All right, let's talk about the fourth way that creators make money, and that is advertising. Uh, This is different from affiliate revenue because typically there's a third party that's placing ads on your content. Uh, The most common way uh, most creators do this is with Google's AdSense uh, and AdWords program. Uh, And this is connected with YouTube's monetization where YouTube will place an ad either as a pre-roll or a mid-roll on your video and they give you a piece of the action. It tends to be algorithmic, uh, so you as the creator don't have a relationship with the advertiser. Uh, You have a relationship with the platform, let's say YouTube, and the advertiser has a relationship with the platform, and that platform acts as the uh, intermediary. Now, if you're a YouTuber, this and you're a popular YouTuber that meets YouTube's guidelines of how popular you have to be to be eligible, this can be the easiest way to make money because you just you know, check the box to say, put ads on my videos, and then you start getting money. It's not great money if, if you're not super popular, but it can be easy money. Just realize that this is algorithmic, which means you're at the mercy of an algorithm that you do not control and you do not understand. In fact, the way this algorithm works is it uses what's called machine learning, which means that no human understands the YouTube algorithm um, fully. Uh, it's super complex. It uses a neural network and it's super fascinating if you get into how it works, but just realize that it is a shifting kind of liquid sand 
foundation. And I don't recommend having advertising be your sole source of revenue, especially when you don't have that relationship with the advertiser. As a general rule, uh, making money with advertising is all about how many views and listens you get. It's not as much about the kind of people who are watching your videos or listening to your podcast as it is about how many people are watching uh, or listening, uh, which is very different from sponsorship, which we'll get to in a second. Advertising can work for bloggers. And actually, I learned this lesson the hard way. On my blog, my personal blog, I didn't have ads because it wasn't a very popular blog. I was posting every once in a while when I felt like it. But then I wrote this blog post about dating and courtship that went viral, it had a million page views in three, four weeks. And uh, I that was really expensive. <laughs> I hosted with premium hosting. WP Engine uh, was my host. And uh, they were fast. You know, I had 100,000 views in one day and it was fast that whole time. But then I had a nice little overage bill at the end of the month. They're like, oh, by the way, the you know, money you were paying was not enough uh, for the amount of traffic that you got. And if I'd have had advertising on my blog, I'd have been paid for every one of those page views and it would have helped to offset uh, those hosting costs. But as it was, I was on the hook for that. Uh, fortunately, WP Engine cut me some slack. I told them if I asked them, what would happen if I upgrade my hosting? Will you forgive this overage fee? And they were like, yes. And so I was able to upgrade my hosting, uh, which I was planning to do anyway. So I ended up, you know, escaping. But if I was in the habit of writing viral blog posts, I really would have um, preferred to have that advertising on my website to help offset that. For podcasters, uh, typically, if you want to get into advertising, you need to be a part of a podcast network unless you're really, really popular. Uh, but in general, uh, advertising on podcasting is hard uh, because of the technical challenges. So while it's very easy on YouTube, it's relatively easy on a blog, advertising on podcasts is tricky, especially if you're wanting to auto insert the ads. Uh, so some podcast networks, if you're a part of the network, they'll you know insert the ad for you. Otherwise you have to, in your own editing environment, add the ad. And at that point, it's not really advertising as much as it is sponsorship. So let's talk about sponsorship. I am the secretary of sponsorship after all, uh, which is a meaningless title, I will admit, but it alliterates. So it's fun. Uh, sponsorship is where you have a relationship directly with the advertiser. The advertiser and the creator uh, have connected in some way. Uh, this is what you see the most uh, on podcasting. So the podcaster reads some copy from the sponsor, and there was some sort of courtship process between the sponsor and the advertiser. Uh, now, this may have been somewhat algorithmic right there on CreateSpace, and CreateSpace advertises on zillions of different podcasts. You just apply online or Audible, you apply online. It's almost more like advertising at that point. But typically, the best money you get from sponsorship is from sponsors who are specifically interested in your specific audience. This is where the number of viewers or listeners uh, you have is not as important as who views or listens to your content. So a good example of this is the How I Built It podcast, uh, which is a podcast focused on WordPress developers, uh, which is a very small audience. So think about kind of in the constellation of people on the planet, a tiny, tiny fraction of those people develop websites on WordPress. This show is never going to be a super popular show in the sense of like a show, say, about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or some TV show, right? That there's more people who watch a TV show than develop on WordPress. But Think about the kind of advertisers who want to talk specifically to WordPress developers. There's a whole ecosystem of people who make tools for WordPress developers who will pay a pretty penny to talk to specifically those kinds of people. So that How I Built It podcast has had sponsors from the very beginning, right? It has hosting companies that support it. It has software uh, companies that make, you know, shopping cart recovery, right? You know, people are checking out and they abandon the shopping cart. We have software that helps bring them back. That is a very niche piece of software. You wouldn't want to advertise that, uh, you know, on a general purpose podcast, but for a podcast specifically for WordPress developers, that is very, very lucrative. And this is one of the things I like about sponsorship is that it allows niche podcasts and niche YouTube channels that may not have a very lucrative um, audience size may have a very lucrative audience uh, demographic or people who are interested in a very specific topic. And so that's what makes sponsorship fun. The other nice thing about sponsorship is that you're not at the mercy of an algorithm. You're at the mercy of your relationship with the sponsor. So as long as you're able to maintain a good relationship with your sponsor and they're getting good results for their sponsorship, 
they're not going to pull their sponsorship because you, you know, you are cussing, right? Presumably, if you cuss in your podcast, they know that. And so you're not going to scare them away. They're, you know, they're buying into you as much as they're buying into your audience. So that sponsorship, we'll talk more about sponsorship in the future, but hopefully that gives you an idea of kind of how sponsorship and advertising is different. Uh, you'll see popular YouTubes, uh, YouTubers will have both. They'll have a pre-roll before the video starts that's placed there by YouTube, assuming that they haven't been demonetized for some sort of bad behavior. And then in the middle of the show, they have the sponsor. You know, like, this episode's brought to you by so-and-so, and they'll give the name of the sponsor. And then uh, at you know maybe they'll have a mid-roll. So you can make, with all of these, there's nothing keeping you from having making money from all seven uh, ways of making money. So let's get on to number six, and that is crowdfunding. Uh, this is raising money on platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Uh, as a custodian of crowdfunding, I've used both Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I like them both. Uh, they, are, they have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, in general, for creatives, I prefer Kickstarter, uh, partly because it has KickTrack, which just gives such great analytics that really helps with the planning. Uh, for technology products, there are some reasons to go with Indiegogo. If you're doing a big launch, though, which you go with is depends on which platform is willing to cut you some breaks. So if you're if you work with one of the big agencies that does Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns, they will often be able to guarantee you f- being featured on the homepage or some other sort of benefit. And you kind of get the two platforms to bid against each other uh, so th- there are there's not one platform that's better right you may be like oh kickstarter has the bigger audience and like yeah but indiegogo has a bigger audience for my specific category or indiegogo is willing to work with me and help me promote uh, the campaign also kickstarter is all or nothing whereas indiegogo allows you to have all or nothing or you raise you keep whatever you want uh, i like all or nothing especially for projects like uh, cds or an album for a band or for a book uh, if i you know need ten thousand dollars to make my book a reality and i only raise two thousand dollars on kickstarter i don't want to be on the hook for that eight thousand dollar balance <laughs> that's uh, a recipe for disaster so where crowdfunding works really well is for products where there's a fixed amount of upfront costs like printing a book like producing an album Uh, Now, I have seen people fund seasons of podcasts on Kickstarter, especially before Patreon came around. This was not an uncommon way of funding a podcast. You fund season one or fund season seven and people will, you know, back uh, on Kickstarter and they'll get some rewards. Uh, I feel that Patreon is the better tool for an ongoing creative process like a podcast. And you can fund we'll talk about patreon next but you could fund a cd on patreon as well so you know every month you have people donating money and you use that to produce one song so instead of you know once a year you produce an album that's got 12 songs on it you have people donating every month and they get a song every month and so it's two different models of, of making money but i really like the the all or nothing approach because it's very motivating So uh, of campaigns that get 60% funded, 99% of them go on to fund 100%. Your backers are going to go out of their way to promote your campaign so that it doesn't fail. And I've seen this with the campaigns that I've run. People are very motivated to share. Uh, And in general, I feel like this creates a stronger, more acute motivation to share than what you'd have on something like Patreon, where it's harder to create that sense of urgency. There's ways of creating urgency on Patreon, but Kickstarter and Indiegogo are just urgent, right? There's a timer ticking down on the top of the page. It's like, you have 14 days, 12 hours, and two minutes left to back this page uh, or back this product. That's really motivating, and that sense of urgency helps you raise your money. Uh, so a, a standard, let's say you're an author, a standard Kickstarter campaign would be with the rewards would be for $10, you get a free ebook copy for $20, you get the ebook copy and a paper copy. And for $30, you get a signed and paper copy of the book, something like that. Um, the same thing with the CD, $10, you get a digital copy, $20, you get the CD uh, on an actual compact disc. Uh, for $30, you get the record on vinyl and, you know, you, you do the levels like that. And then you're able to know, okay, I need $10,000 for the studio time and to print the CDs and you, you work it all ahead of time. And one of the things I put in my course was a planning spreadsheet on how to plan your budget, but you just can plan it on a piece of paper. And there's a lot more I could say about crowdfunding and a lot more I will say on crowdfunding in future episodes, but hopefully that gives you an idea of kind of how crowdfunding works. So let's talk about the final 
main way that creators make money, and that's through patronage. It's nothing new about this. Uh, a lot of the famous artists of old had patrons. Now, instead of lots of patrons, they often had uh, just a handful of patrons. Uh, but a lot of the portraits that they would paint where they were paid for that specific portrait. And this is also not new on the internet. Uh, so a PayPal donate button has been around for decades online where you know people you know, click the donate on, on PayPal. I have not seen the donate on PayPal to be a very successful way of patronage. It's hard to make money that way. Even Facebook now has a donate button. It's hard uh, to do that. Uh, the people who are doing this best are podcasters like Dan Carlin. Uh, he's, you know, really pushes getting donations on PayPal and he has a lot of people who donate to him on PayPal. He's able to do this full time with PayPal donations. Uh, he also has advertising uh, from Audible and he has a few other sources of revenue, but I get the impression that the majority of the money that he makes are from those donations. Uh, but it's hard because people are not getting a reward for that donation and it can feel like that money is going into kind of a black hole. Uh, so the best form of patronage, in my opinion, is to use a platform like Patreon. With Patreon, you're able to have really clear rewards for your backers, it's very transparent what's going on, and uh, you don't have to build out any technology. <laughs> so they give you a really robust uh, techno set of technologies. Uh, you could recreate everything that Patreon does on your WordPress website, but it would be a lot more work and your time is valuable and your time really should be spent in general working on creating whatever it is that you create <laughs> instead of working on building out a technology uh, solution. Uh, there are people who create Patreon-like tools for WordPress, and I'm hoping at some point in the future to have them on the show and to talk about the you know pros and cons of doing it yourself with some sort of membership platform. I actually created a membership site years ago. It was called the Best Seller Society, and it was a membership site for learning how to write books. And we spent tens of thousands of dollars on a really expensive membership platform. We spent tens of thousands of dollars shooting really expensive videos, and it, we spent a lot of money. <laughs> we, we made some money but we spent a lot of money and i really wish something like patreon had existed uh, back then or some of these other tools that make membership sites so much cheaper and easier to do uh, so the idea with patreon is that people either donate every month you know a certain amount of money or every uh, content creation event so if you have a weekly podcast they pay a dollar per podcast or two dollars per podcast uh, and it's up to you whether you go monthly or weekly uh, or sort of per piece of content. And there are some pros and cons of doing it both ways. Uh, one advantage of doing it per piece of content is that if you create content more frequently than monthly, it can be a way of having higher prices without it seeming higher. So a dollar an episode feels cheaper than $4 a month. It's the same amount of money, but it just feels cheaper. So that, that can be an advantage of doing it that way. But the thing I like about Patreon and the patronage model is that your money comes in in a much more even way. So Kickstarter, you get this huge lump sum, and then you get nothing for months and months afterwards. So like, if you're funding a podcast season, say you've got six months of a season that you're funding, you get all the money for half a year all at once. And man, you better be good at budgeting so you're not hungry on month five and six because it requires a lot of discipline to have that money in your account and not spend it. It also requires good estimation of costs, which can be harder to do. Uh, the advantage of Patreon is that you get paid every month and you have an idea of what you're going to be making next month based off what you're making this month. So it makes it a little bit easier to plan. The money comes in in more even ways. So those are the seven ways to make money, seven primary ways. Merch, products, affiliate revenue, ads, sponsorship, crowdfunding, and patronage. Those are not the only ways to make money. There are so many other ways. You can get paid for your song plays on Spotify. You can get paid to go on TV if you're famous enough. You can be in somebody else's ads. Uh, you can uh, get paid through Super Chats. You can get paid through the Brave browser and a whole lot more. Uh, but those are the seven primary ways. Uh, and again, in future episodes, we'll talk about each one into more individually and as well as these others. But uh, in conclusion, I hope that you see that there are multiple ways to fund your work. And if one of these ways makes you feel uncomfortable, or if you feel overwhelmed, you're like, oh my gosh, the idea of doing a Kickstarter campaign is overwhelming. Don't do a Kickstarter campaign. 
or you're like, I don't want to deal with advertising. I don't want to be afraid that YouTube is going to demonetize me. Don't do advertising, right? Uh, or you're like, I don't want to deal with patrons and their, all of their noise and them requesting things. Don't deal with patrons. You, you can mix and match based off of what you're creating and what your audience wants. And I do want to say when it comes to which of these to use, don't just look at what you want to do. Also look at what your uh, backers want. It may be that people are being like, hey, will you sign up with Patreon? I want to give you money. <laughs> I've sent that email to people uh, being like, hey, I want to back you on Patreon. Uh, I don't want to give you money on, on PayPal. That's a hassle. I'd rather back you on Patreon. I've actually sent that email uh, to podcasters. So listen, uh, ask your uh, fans what they want. Say, hey, do you want a CD? Do you want a Patreon? You know, let them give you that feedback. Don't let that be the end all, but take that into account. Ultimately, it's about creating art, but it's also about serving your audience, <laughs> serving your fans. And the better you serve them, uh, the more you thrill them with your art, the more of them they will be. They will go out and spread the word and more people will come. Uh, so... Just one request, if I may, before we go, please leave me a review on iTunes. This is part of our initial binge drop, and we really need iTunes reviews uh, to spread the word about this show. Uh, if we want to have a good chance of this show taking off, I really am hoping that we can get into iTunes' new and noteworthy um, section in, their, in the iTunes um, podcast directory. And one of the main things they look at is reviews. So if you would be willing to leave a review, I personally would really appreciate it. Uh, you have been listening to The Creative Funding Show, giving you innovative ideas on how to fund your art without selling out. I'm Thomas Umstadt. Thank you so much for listening.